All right, well, welcome back. Uh, sorry for the uh, short break that some of you had there, but uh, I almost felt like since we're a smaller, more intimate group, we should be like debating everything we've heard up until now. Um, I will appreciate that, uh, you know, it, one of the th great things about events like this is we hear many sides to these very complex problems. Um, and being a geneticist, as I was thinking about all these behavioral topics that we just recently heard about, how do you change consumer behavior? I always remind myself um, there will be a genetic component to that as well that we probably don't quite understand either. Anyway, we're going to talk about something that's a little more tractable, which is what are some of the solutions that innovation can provide to the farm? And how can we help really accomplish, I think, where this whole topic is going, which is really about you know, how can agriculture change and shift the emphasis from productivity to something that is about both productivity and ensuring a safe and affordable food supply and a sustainable food supply that isn't harmful to the environment. Um, as with anything that we discuss in the future, we always have to have a safe harbor statement. This just tells you that uh, everything and anything I say today may or may not come true, so if you invest in bear, that is at your peril currently based on only this information. So, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide because I think a lot of the points have been made earlier today. Um, maybe just a couple of things. First of all, I fundamentally believe that innovation can help us get there. Um, Bear, we spend more than two billion euros a year in research and development, more than any other company in the agricultural sector. Um, it's a big investment and it's a big bet that what we can bring to farmers can help farmers be successful in this. And that's maybe the second point. One of the things we should always remind ourselves is that there has to ultimately be economic incentive built into these solutions that we're building for farmers. Because farming is not an obligation. Agriculture is, honestly, I always say, agriculture is nothing more than a land use decision. And farmers do not need to use land to produce food. You know, one of the very interesting things that's going on, for example, in the Midwest right now is, there are farmers being approached by solar panel companies where they're leasing the land from a farmer, and this is highly productive land, so we're not talking pasture lands or lands that have very low use. We're talking about land that is currently very high, has very high productivity, and solar panel companies are coming in and offering the farmer twice as much as they can earn growing a crop. What choice do you think they're gonna make? In go the solar panels. And that's not to suggest that that's where everything goes, but I think we have to have a system in place that ultimately will provide e the appropriate economic incentives that builds the balance of what we're ultimately trying to achieve, which is how to help customers, I'm, for me at least, farmers, make appropriate choices to help us in this tremendously challenging balance between productivity and sustainability. I want to spend the rest of the time with you just over the next few minutes is talking about just three new examples of innovation that I see as sort of sentinels of where we can go with innovation and how it can help us achieve this balance. The first one is probably the biggest one. Um, and what this is, is what we call short stature corn. I want you to think about the Green Revolution and Norman Borlaug and what was achieved in terms of food production for both wheat and rice by reducing the overall height of the crop. Now in that instance, what they were really trying to achieve is allowing the crop to be then use more fertilizer to become more productive. In this instance, we're choosing to lower the size of the corn crop for different purposes and reasons that I think really fit in well with where we're going. So let me let, share with you what those purposes are. So first of all, and maybe the most obvious from this picture is hopefully you can pick out the short stature corn. It's the rows of corn that are still standing. Right next to it, you see corn that is conventional corn, so it's the same genetics, just we have the shortened version on the, on the right side. And what you see is the standability of the crop. So one of the big challenges farmers face around the globe is with conditions coming from wind or other types of conditions, which basically cause the crop to lodge or what we call green snap. And that results in crop loss. So you have a lot of corn that's down, it's not gonna be harvestable, you have significant yield reduction. And these instances of wind conditions actually are, are increasing. Um, two years ago, we had in the Midwest a tremendous windstorm that swept through a section of the Midwest, hit millions and millions of acres there, and just devastated um, those acres of corn. A lot of our short corn plots were still standing. 
So not that it's wind proof, but it's substantially better to help in the farmer be successful with, with the climactic conditions that are changing. The second one is the opportunity it represents to help a grower get later into the season in things like nutrient application. So we heard earlier today about the fact that much of the fertility that gets applied onto the field doesn't actually end up in the plant. One of the solutions to help with that is, is to better have better optimization of timing of when fertility is applied. When you have a shorter corn crop, you can actually get in with ground equipment because the booms can go over the top of the field and allow the farmer to do late in season nutrient application. So it's an opportunity for precision application of fertility, which helps us to be more efficient with the, with the use of nitrogen fertilizers. A third thing that it does as a crop is it also allows us, because you can pack more plants, because it's more resilient to these wind conditions, we can actually plant, we can pack in more plants per hectare. So we can increase the planting density. That ultimately translates into more productivity. So you get more productivity per hectare, which ultimately also helps with the agricultural intensification and minimizing the, the footprint of agriculture in that corn crop. And then the last one where we're still investigating, but it's very interesting is, as we qualitatively look at short stature corn, we see that there's more carbon ultimately that we see going into the root system. And that's an opportunity for carbon sequestration, which is a very important part, I think, of what we need to drive harder in agriculture, which is how we can grow crops in a carbon positive way where we're actually sequestering carbon into the ground and keeping it there. So putting more roots into the ground is a mechanism of putting more carbon into the ground. So really amazing product. We see this actually fitting literally on every corn acre around the globe ultimately. And we have an approach technically where we're starting with our plant breeding to introduce it into the crop. We'll follow that on with a biotechnology version which is a better version of the technology and allows us to have more adaptability across more acres. And also we have in our early research programs uh, genome edited versions that we're building as well to further expand the footprint. The second one is, and we're not the only company working on this, but the idea, of course, of how can we help crops that don't today have mechanisms to do nitrogen fixation the way, for example, legumes do, but how can you help cereal crops like corn or wheat, for example, fix nitrogen? And the path to that is potentially through the use of microbes that naturally do end fixation and either selection and ultimately adaptation to the corn crop to make that work and make it happen. Our approach has been to use synthetic biology. So we're applying synthetic biology through partnerships. We have a partnership with a company called Ginkgo Bioworks um, in the US, which is a leader in the synthetic biology space. And working together with Ginkgo, we've had a joint venture working on this whole concept of how can we engineer microbes that basically will infiltrate the corn plant, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, and then provide it to the plant as an alternative source of nitrogen. And we have some very lofty goals in doing this. There are other startups in the space. Uh, some of them are in the audience today, like Pivot Bio. They also have already even products in the market which are not driven by synthetic biology, but are also trying to help farmers come up with solutions that they can provide to a grower to help reduce their synthetic nitrogen need. And the beautiful thing about nitrogen coming from biological source like that, of course, is it's right there and it's immediately available to the crop. So also very exciting and a very interesting space. And I think synthetic biology in general is gonna be a toolbox that we're gonna to apply to a host of other problems in the future as well. And then the last one, probably the one you've not heard very much about, is a very interesting one which relates to the whole idea of how do you keep carbon in the soil. So I always like to think about carbon sequestration really in, in farm fields is anchored on a couple of really very basic agronomic principles. The first is the promotion of no-till or minimal-till agriculture, because it's like a pie crust. The minute you break that crust with a plow, you release carbon into the atmosphere. So one of the best things farmers can do to ensure carbon stays in the ground is not to till. But another thing they can do is plant what we call a cover crop. So using a off-season, uh, crop and there are various types of plant species that are used as cover crops. Those are typically then stay in the soil through the season and then of course we plant over the top with the next, next crop uh, in the rotation. 
What is unique here is that this is a weedy species called pennycress that has been adapted to become actually a cover crop. But not only is it a cover crop just for the purposes of retaining carbon, but it's also being developed to become a cash crop for the grower. So when a grower that's in a corn soy, rotain, corn soy rotation, they're actually gonna have a winter oil seed crop with a harvestable oil seed at the, in the spring before planting in their rotation to soy, which they'll be able to then use that oil. One of the main targets for that market is gonna be using it for, for biodiesel. Now, in order to do that, there's been both breeding that's taken place and genome editing to help to optimize the oil and other features of the product in the seed that allow that seed to be valuable for off-takers in the market. We actually have uh, partnerships with both Bungie and Chevron together. We co-own Covercrest, and we're using that. We're on our side, we're further developing the, the uh, technology and the crop, and then they'll be further developing the use cases for it. So hopefully with that, you have three interesting innovation examples, I think, of how we're continuing to work toward not just the more traditional things that we do, but how we're helping farmers, I think, in this great challenge of what can we do in agriculture to really make it continue to be very productive, but also to make it very sustainable. So thanks for the time. Very enjoyable sets of panels, and I think we have another panel follow-on.